so nice to see um, the blend of the two universities here in the gallery tonight. Some new faces, and I appreciate you crossing the bridge. I think it's a great, um, a great time to collaborate, and communicate. So thanks for coming. <laughs> talking to Tatu Burio, he's uh, from Espo in Finland, a couple of years ago actually about an exhibit here. And um, I was putting together a, uh, an exhibit for FinFest and he donated a piece of artwork to Finland, to Finlandia and that's how I got to know him. Um, he was in that exhibit and we got to talking about um, putting up a, a solo show of his work. So I was really happy that um, a year and a half later or so I could put together this exhibit. Tatu was unable to come uh, from Finland. He is a teacher there and um, he is, his teaching responsibilities kept him there. So I'm hoping that he can come later. But his work really stands, I think, on its own. It's, um, I, I find it very uh, thought-provoking and poetic. And um, I've really enjoyed being with it in, in the gallery and being quiet with it and thinking <coughs> and, and looking closely. And um, very gratefully, um, I talked to a uh, Dr. Alex Morrison about presenting a talk here tonight about art and philosophy, and she graciously accepted. So thank you, Alex. Um, <coughs> Dr. Morrison is a visiting assistant professor of philosophy in the humanities department at Michigan Tech University, and her interests include uh, 20th century continental philosophy and, and feminist philosophy. And so we had talked about um, collaborating maybe uh, in the future about bringing together art and philosophy, and then this exhibit came up and I thought this is a great time to start. So this is our first step at uh, some collaborating between um, Dr. Morrison and, and the gallery. So um, without further ado, I will um, let Alex take over and um, share with us some of her thoughts about um, the, the intersection of art and philosophy. Hello, thanks, thanks for coming this evening. Um, I'd like to thank Carrie for, for giving me the opportunity to talk to you this evening and also to Finlandia for hosting this event. Um, well, I've only recently become um, acquainted with Tatu Viorio's work, and although we do very different things, our concerns intersect in, in ways that I hope will be edifying for you. Um, I'd like to take just about 15 minutes or so to briefly sketch out some of Viorio's philosophical influences and connect these ideas to a few of his works. Carrie asked me to speak because in a very noticeable way, Tatu Doria's work is influenced by some of the philosophers whose work he has clearly read and digested. <laughs> I hope that through this brief talk, I might be able to introduce you to a different way of looking and thinking at the work that you come to see today. So Doria's work draws upon the rich tradition of philosophical thought that emerged at the turn of the 20th century in Europe. This continental philosophy, and it's called continental because it's primarily French and German thinkers, um, because the English-speaking world went a different direction, <laughs> essentially. So con continental philosophy is primarily associated with two different um, strands of, uh, or schools of thought, uh, phenomenology and existential thought. Um, both, so, so these two schools of thought are, I think, really intertwined, sometimes in, indistinguishable from each other, and both maintain that philosophy should begin with a careful description of the forms, the forms of human experience. So the most influential figure in both schools is the German philosopher Martin Heidegger, and I just thought, for those of you who have never seen him before, <laughs> you might want to. <laughs> so a hallmark of Heidegger's philosophy is his assertion that the human being is not primarily or first a rational mind or brain in contemporary parlance that has to figure out how to get outside of itself in order to find out something about the world around it, the objects and people out there. Rather, for Heidegger, the human being is thrown into a world and
and is fundamentally immersed in that world from day one. Now, this might seem like a fairly obvious kind of an observation, but this idea that human beings are situated in a world changes everything. If we are primarily existences situated in a world, a world shaped by social, cultural, political, and historical forces, then our understanding is always already mediated um, and shaped by that world, even our self-understanding. So if so we are not robots or computers, <laughs> isolated, measuring and studying objects that are somehow indifferent to us. We choose to study certain objects and not others. We care about certain kinds of things and not others because we are first shaped by our situation, by the languages we speak, by the people around us, by the books we read, by the mundane tasks we perform, by the technologies which with we habitually engage. All of this is shaping us before we make what we like to call a conscious or rational decision. So the situation shapes you before you know it, so to speak. This means that individual existence, a self, finds himself or herself in being exposed. So a self finds itself by being exposed to and being in contact with other individuals and things. And yet, even though we are in many ways determined by our various situations, at the same time, we're free. This is my life. I have my own life. And while I've been thrown into this situation, one that I did not create myself, nevertheless, there is still a way in which I must choose it and make it my own. If I don't, if I just do what everybody else does and think what everybody else thinks and even rebel in the same way that everyone else rebels, then there's a way in which I shirked my responsibility for my existence. So this tension between my being thrown into a world that wasn't my own making and my having to in some way make this foreign world my own uh, is a paradoxical situation. It's paradoxical, paradoxical because I have to take responsibility for something, this whole situation, that I couldn't possibly take responsibility for. So thus this paradox can give rise to the experience of anxiety, <laughs> an experience of the burden of my mortal existence. Heidegger famously argues that angst is an experience in which the familiar situation of my life becomes uncanny and unfamiliar to me. Existential angst makes my whole life suddenly and inexplicably meaningless. But this experience can be, he argues, the catalyst for rethinking what I have habitually taken to be true. The artwork does this on a smaller scale, but nevertheless it can also provoke us to question things we habitually take for granted by making things unfamiliar to us or presenting familiar things in an uncanny situation or a different context. So many philosophers after Heidegger, like Simone de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre, and again, I just couldn't help myself. <laughs> um, so many philosophers, like many French philosophers especially, agree with Heidegger, and they agree that this paradoxical situation, as anxious as it, as it is, just is the human condition. There's no getting away from it. So Sartre calls this the anguish of freedom, meaning that the, the meaning and the value of my life and my world is established only in my relation to my choices, to my actions, and to my commitments. I believe that tattoo, for Tattoo Viorio, and perhaps, perhaps this is one way to think about the idea of alchemy, the name of the series that's um, here tonight. <clears throat> For example, Burio acknowledges that he was explicitly trying to explore the experience of this paradox, the experience of anxiety in his existence insulation. And this is just from this is just from um, a few months ago, I think about six months ago. He's 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 um, he's had this installation in a two different places, but this is. Um, an interesting, <laughs> interesting choice. This is in a park in Helsinki called, and I don't speak Finnish, but it's 
Bruto Puisto, Bruto Puisto, but it translates as play park. Um, so it's kind of tiny, right? So um, this, it's called Plague Park because it used to be a cemetery um, and all the victims of uh, the 1710 um, plague, Black Plague, um, are buried underneath this public park. So it's unfortunate I can't play the video. On his website, he has, he, he mounted a camera and just aimed it at this door. <laughs> And, um, and filmed people in us uh, over the whole course of, course of the day um, encountering this, this exhibit. And the main thing that he says about this is that he doesn't want to make this door into an object. That really what this piece is about is to make the, the passers-by and the people who come across it into subjects. Um, and to really think about it, you also have to think about it as a, as a passageway and not an object, right? It's, and of course, I can't talk about all of the associations, but um, of course, it's in a cemetery or a former cemetery that, well, it, it still kind of is a cemetery. The, the bones are still there, right? Um, so it's, it's interesting. It's a passageway in a lot of different ways. <coughs> and when you watch, the, if you watch the, the video, you'll see people you know, just as they do, people just kind of walk by and look at it and kind of curl, curl up their nose like, what's this? Other people stop and have their pictures taken in the, in the passageway. Some people almost bump into it because, you know, they're busy doing this. So, but he, that's what it was. That's what this piece is for him. So it's kind of not right to see it in this as a photograph. It, it changes the whole experience of it. Is there anything particular on the door, or is it just a stage? It's just a door. He did. He um. He just found it. Uh, he took it for, away from a, a van. Took it from an abandoned house. And so um. So when I was thinking about this piece, I was wondering um if he's doing something very similar with some of the works, the sculptures here, the way he's trying to make the the audience into subjects and getting you to implicate you in the seeing of the thing uh, and seeing of the, uh, the objects. Like, these aren't objects, right? <laughs> I mean, this one is a good example. Um, in order to see it, not only do I have to be really intimate with it, I get up to it and I start looking at the figures and, oh no, I've seen my own reflection. Suddenly, I'm seeing myself seeing the figure. And this happens several times in this exhibit, that, that you are you're trying to look at the gestures of the little figures that he's, that he's made, and you get up close to them, and then you see yourself. Like, he's doing this on purpose, obviously. And there are two figures, too. Yes, yes. So you're, you see yourself contemplating the contemplator. <laughs> so, um, but this comes up again and again in his work, and we'll see. Well, well you'll, you've probably already noticed. Um, so, it's his emphasis is on your subjectivity, but not only your subjectivity. It's um, you experience yourself as a subject, discovering yourself through something else, through through another subject or through another object. So, I think that's that's really key to a lot of the ideas that are kind of behind this work here. Um, so I just want to maybe go back and speak a little bit more about the philosophy. So, and of course, there's a way in which our being subjects um, is tied to our ability to make decisions, right? Um, that's kind of what this work is about. Um, you decide to pass it by, or you decide to walk through it, or you decide to um, have your picture taken in the middle of it. And so, our subjectivity is tied to these, this ability to make decisions and freedom, but our freedom is also a kind of loss, right? Um, as Simone de Beauvoir puts it, because we're mortal and because we're free, we're constituted by a, a lack. So a big part of who we are is <coughs> paradoxi paradoxically what we are not. Um, we are finite, so we can't know or do or see everything. A decision we make to study A means we don't study B or C. Um, decisions to, to do A, we don't do 
something else. Um, and we look, and we even it's right down to our perception. So when I look at A, I, I'm blind to B and C. So, um, so this theme also of invisibility um, that's part of our being, embodied beings, is, is really, I think, um, central to what he's thinking about. The French philosopher, Jean de Nancy, <coughs> this is, so Jean de Nancy is, uh, he's very ill right now, but he's still with us, and he was a student of Heidegger, um, and he's a philosopher and is a right, um, Tatsu, uh, two years ago, did a series um, that's named after his book Corpus, and he called this painting Jean-Luc, and this one Nancy. <laughs> but we will. <laughs> we can talk about that later. But this. Um, so Jean-Luc Nancy. So he's. Tatu explicitly said to me that he's read. He's read a lot of Heidegger and Nancy and the Um So I just wanted to point out that Nancy also argues, following <coughs> Heidegger, that. Just as our identities are multiple and shaped by uh, the world outside of us, our bodies are, are not singular either. Um, they're not discrete, isolated things. Nancy argues that our bodies are, are because they open us onto the world, um, they open us to change, sometimes radical alterations. So we acquire new skills, or we're alleviated by technical devices, or, or prosthetics, and so on. Um, Nancy argues that because of this openness, the body is not a singularity, but rather a plurality. And this is a big theme in his work. I think he has a, one of his books is called Being Singular Plural. Um, so this means that we don't experience ourselves directly. This is, of course, very similar to what Beauvoir was talking about when she says that we are constituted by a lack. So if we only know ourselves as a reflection back from the world, if we're mediated constantly by the world back to ourselves, then inevitably there are gaps, there are ambiguities. We never get that direct experience of ourselves, immediate and original. I think sometimes that's what this one is about. So to wrap up, I think it seems that the artist needs to make the work in order to see himself. And I think that we need to see art in order to see ourselves. And this leaves us with the question of art. If the, indi if the individual's identity is multiple, an embodied multiplicity, then art can no longer be thought of as an object produced by a singular artist, not, at least not in any straightforward way. So art is not the simple outward expression of an artist's inner thoughts and feelings. And art is also not just what I claim it is, um, a single member of the audience. Um, that's another way of saying, of course, beauty is not in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> Rather, art is an event. And as an event, its meaning is ambiguous and open for discussion. This also means that art is the expression of a whole situation and that situation requires an audience as much as it needs an artist. <laughs>